So hello and welcome to our series of podcasts from our Arrow Vision event in 2019. Wow, what a day, eh? Hey? What a day. This is um, so. This is the first time we've run this event, and essentially what we've done is taken over the whole of Olympia. And I'm not even joking, the whole of Olympia. It's, it's a big old place, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And we filled it. We didn't do too bad, did we, actually? We've done Congrats fantastic. to all the Arrow team involved. That's what I'd say. Very much. That was a very much big thing. old call, that. So what you're going to listen to over the next uh, six weeks is essentially the sessions, the breakout sessions that we had at Vision. So we've recorded them all as audio files, and we're essentially going to put them out for your listening delights. And I tell you what, that's going to cover a heck of a lot of topics as well, isn't it? Yes. So um, we've had uh, data intelligence, AI, IoT. So apologies in advance, you're going to hear my dulcet tones again. Security, cloud, and next generation data center. Wow. I, so, I, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. no. I, we're too polite, mate. We are too polite, Nothing aren't changes. we? Yes. <laughs> so I think, um, hopefully, yeah, for your listening pleasure, um, if you were unable to attend Vision this year, um, I think, yeah, you'd get an insight as to hopefully some of the uh, some of the content, some of the trends, some of the some of the latest news, some of the updates from vendors old and new, yeah, absolutely, and from uh, across the uh, the Arrow family. Yes, very much so. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, you know, I, I would always suggest any feedback, much received. Yeah, hashtag Arrow Family on Twitter. Yeah. Awesome. And we will, uh, yeah, hope you enjoy it and we'll speak to you soon. Brilliant. Enjoy. Welcome to this track, Data Intelligence. So I'm the track leader. My name is David Fern. I'm the global practice leader for AI and data intelligence at Arrow. Um, the title of this story, the title of this track, it is a story though, because data is a story. It has a start, a middle, and an end. And we're going to tell you about what that story is over the course of the next 45, 50 minutes. But the title of this really is all about before artificial intelligence comes data intelligence. So in organizations today, there's lots and lots and lots of bright ideas. We are not sure of people going, if I had this information, if I had this data, I could do this, I could predict that, I could walk into a, a meeting more confident that I knew exactly where I was with that customer at this point in time, wouldn't that be excellent? And that would genuinely drive growth. But the problem with all of this is the plumbing in the middle. How you get from idea to outcome with data, it's not easy. In fact, it's incredibly difficult. But with difficulty comes high, high rewards. So where are we today? What does is, what is a journey through the data maturity lifecycle look like? So we start at the left. Siloed data, non-scalable, low value. Do you know what that's called? It's called Excel. Okay. How many times have you picked up an Excel spreadsheet from another colleague and tried to figure out how it works, decipher it, and then given up and made your own one. It's quite a common situation to be in. Siloed data. The data that's in that spreadsheet is proprietary to that person. They know how it works. They know how they've manipulated it, the formulas they've applied. But then transposing that to other people in the organization is really difficult. People put different types of data in. People manipulate it to their own ends. That's fine, but it doesn't scale. It doesn't provide the information that is critical to the growth of a business. It's what we call descriptive analytics. What's happened? We all know what's happened. We either did sell something or didn't sell something. Hit a deadline or didn't hit a deadline. What we need to move towards is diagnostic analytics. Why did it happen? Further on from that, where we can really start to improve business efficiency and business impact is what will happen. And the nirvana of where we need to get to is prescriptive analytics. Try saying that 10 times. Descriptive to, prescri descriptive to prescriptive. How do we make it happen? How can we influence the future? Surely that is the absolute nirvana of any business out here to be able to fundamentally drive a customer to do an action that you've already bought the stock for, or you've already 
arranged or put, place, put resources in place for. That's the goal. That's the goal of anything, and it can be absolutely achieved by data, but not when your data is on the left, but when your data is on the right. We move from siloed data to distributed information. Distributed information so that everyone in the business can take advantage of that information to make data-driven decisions. Highly scalable. So this data has to be able to be everywhere it's needed, at the edge, in the core, in the cloud, in the applications that we need it to be in, and it has to be succinct. And high value. This will drive high value outcomes. So going from left to right looks great on a spreadsheet, but how, or great on a chart, but how, how do we actually get there? So this is a problem that we've been wrangling. Arrow started our data journey about five years ago. Um, we built some proof of concepts, and we built some interesting systems, and we ran into the, exactly the problem of how do we go from one side to another in data. And we basically stumbled across this methodology that then turned out to be really, really, really powerful at helping our customers to build repeatable, scalable, high-value decision-making systems. That's what we call the Arrow Data Strategy Framework. So the, eight, the, the five steps, essentially, that you can take to go from, well, once you've got an idea of what you, actually what you want to answer, the five steps of how we go from A to B are ingest, transform, store, protect, and explore. So ingest is how we decouple the information we need from the information our systems can support. I can't tell you the amount of times when we've asked ourselves in Arrow, we know why someone did buy something, because we can look back at why you know, sales history, simple. But why didn't someone buy something? And what data do I need to answer that question? That's not an easy question, because you probably need to bring in customer satisfaction, you need to bring in marketing information, you might need to bring through click-through rates on a website. How many people could understand how to ingest that information into Excel, manipulate it, and have an answer that you could then act on to drive an outcome in the future? So to that end, we have Microsoft who are going to come and talk to us. We have Jody from Microsoft who's going to come talk to us specifically about the tooling and the services and the solutions they have to help you be more intelligent with how you can bring and manipulate and do more things with more data. Once we have that information, we then need to transform it. We don't need to transform it once, we need to transform it at scale. We need to start to develop what we term the data pipeline. This is essentially how we take that ingested data, apply intelligence to it, and turn it into fundamental information. Information that we can then act upon and information that we can then drive business outcomes with. And we're really lucky today, we've got Sika from Splunk, who's going to come and tell you all about how Splunk turn data into information. The next one we've got is store. So once we've built this information, the next thing we have to do is actually store it somewhere. And storing doesn't just mean put it on a disk. Store it means make sure it's exactly where it needs to be, when it needs to be, it's up to date, it's timely, and it's succinct. It also means storing it compliantly with regulations, it's a huge amount, and it's a huge topic. And we're really lucky today we've got Grant from NetApp who's going to come talk to us about that. Next off, though, we have the issue around once we've actually done those steps, how do we actually protect it? I don't want to go through all that effort, come up with some really insightful information that could make a massive difference to my business and be completely thwarted by a, store, a disk failure array. So we've got Convault who are going to come and tell you about how you can take backup and protection and make it a business critical uh, piece of the puzzle. And last, but by no means least, we have Explore. So Explore is all about, once we've got this information, how do we get it in front of as many people in the business as possible? One of the biggest issues today, in my personal experience with analytics, is it's reserved for the power users, reserved for those people who are you know, really powerful and, and understand what they do. And, and that it's not there for the masses. Why not? In, in Arrow, every single person is faced with making decisions that data could help them with every single day. 
So by essentially turning that information and making it more freely available to many more people, we can fundamentally drive forward change and build better data-driven solutions. And today we're really lucky. We've got Veritas here to come and tell us all about that. So without further ado, and without falling off the stage this time, I'm going to introduce Jody to come up and talk to us about Microsoft's ingestion strategy. Thank you, Jody. So my name is Jodie Rogers and I lead uh, Microsoft's Big Data and Advanced Analytics business for the UK. And for the next 15 minutes I'm going to talk to you around how Power BI and Azure data services can help you to unify your customer's business and unlock insights from their data at scale. So I think it's a really common term these days that people say data is the new oil. And, and it is true that there's a lot of value that can be unlocked out of not only your own data, but also your customers' data. And our customers are really looking to us now to be able to use their data as an asset, and they want to be able to leverage their data to create a competitive advantage, to become more innovative, and to really differentiate themselves. So unlocking value out of the data is, is not an easy task, and there's many challenges that our customers are all facing. So the first one is, is the volume. The amount of data that we have is growing exponentially and I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. The next is the rate in which data is kind of coming and we need to ingest data. So data is, is, is growing and it's coming from all different sources and we need to become more efficient at how we ingest data, how we process it, how we store it, and then finally how we actually understand it and, and what we're going to do with it. And finally, uh, data is incredibly varied. So customers are starting to use a lot more applications. On average, we know that small businesses use around 14 applications, and our enterprise customers use just below 500 applications. And these applications are creating and storing data in completely different formats. A lot of this data is unstructured, and it's not going to easily fit within an Excel spreadsheet or in a, a database, an application database. So what we're seeing is that we're actually creating a lot of data silos, and this is the main challenge that our customers are facing when they're trying to harness their data and actually um, get some insights out of that. And it's because all of this data is isolated that they're not seeing the complete picture. The good news is that we know that when customers can fully harness their data, that they're going to outperform their competitors. So we have three customer examples within uh, Heathrow Airport. We know that they're using real-time analytics to help anticipate their passenger flow and to um, basically avoid disruption. We know that Rockwell Automation, who are they sell oil um, manufacturing equipment, we know that they're using predictive analytics. And on average, they're saving $300,000 a day. And finally, my favorite, ASOS, we know that they provide great customer service, they, they make it super personalized, and they have a really great recommendation engine for their customers. And all of these customer solutions sit on the Azure data platform, and they leverage Power BI. So Heathrow, for example, they had all of their, their data sources in the back end. Um, they were all kind of in a good shape. But what they needed to do was create powerful uh, visualization reports through Power BI to put these insights into their kind of airport staff's ha um, hands. So if there's a change in, um, in the airstreams and they know that there's going to be 20 flights delayed, they know that 6,000 6, passengers are going to come into Heathrow Airport at 6 o'clock. So they get that information two or three hours earlier, and they can make sure they have the correct um, staff and the correct resources to be able to handle that disruption efficiently. Next, with Rockwell Automation, uh, they are ingesting data uh, at a petabyte scale, and they need an analytical solution that can handle that efficiently. And this is because they're not just looking at their real-time data coming through their IoT sensors, but they're also looking at their historical data to figure out when the, um, the correct time is to service their machinery. So instead of waiting until that, that equipment fails, they want to make sure they're getting an engineer out at the right time so they can service it and it's fully running and they're not going to be losing money. And then finally, with all the enhancements from artificial intelligence, ASOS has actually built machine learning models um, to run its recommendation systems. So they get 5,000 new products a week and they know through running their machine learning models, looking at customers' browsing history and what they've purchased recently, that they're going to recommend the correct product to that customer at the right time. So another thing that these customers have in common is 
it's not just data silos that have been an issue for them and the fact that they're dealing with different types of data, but they were all um, not satisfied with their existing on-premises analytical solution. So they had to make a strategic decision around were they going to invest um, to build, to buy more hardware for their on-premises solution, or were they going to take, uh, make the move and transition to Azure, or the, the, a cloud? Um, they chose Azure, luckily for me. Um, and then also, because they've been buying and adopting all different products and services, they've kind of built a complex solution that they then need to manage. And it requires different skill sets, and it also um, costs a lot because a lot of these solutions overlap with their capabilities. So when you add all these four issues together, the customers were kind of experiencing rising costs, and that's why they all decided to move, make the move to Azure because they knew that they could unify all of their data by creating this one hub for their data within Azure Data Lake Storage. Um, they knew that they could support both unstructured and structured data and that their solutions could actually run at scale. So when they were worried about the, the amount of data that they had that was growing, they knew that they could take advantage of the elastability and scalability of the cloud, and that they weren't going to pay over the odds for that. Finally, because Azure uses the same familiar tool sets, they didn't have the kind of the skills issue that they were used to dealing with. And they also had a large partner ecosystem that they could call upon, and you're going to hear from some of them today, around how they can integrate within the Azure data services and also you know, bring in different ISV solutions too. So all of this resulted in a, a lower TCO. And all of those customers had a similar architecture. So they were using Azure Data Factory to ingest that data. This was then being stored in Azure Data Lake Storage. So their business analysts could then um, basically consume this data and get those insights instantly. But at the same time, this data could be brought up into the Azure data services, and IT professionals and also data scientists could enhance and enrich this data. And then that same data could be brought back down into the storage, and the business analysts could consume this data without kind of having to do any of the heavy lifting or have to learn those skills themselves. But seeing as we've been given the topic of ingestion today, I just wanted to focus a little bit on Azure Data Factory. So Azure Data Factory is our hybrid data integration service. So what you will see is that you can integrate data from unstructured and structured data sources, and you can bring this into the Azure Data Services to kind of transform it and then store it within different data marts in um, Azure SQL Data Warehouse. So this allows you to kind of get over the data silos that we were previously having customers complaining about. It's also hybrid. So we have 80 out-of-the-box um, connectors. So you can connect onto not only your on-premises data, uh, your, your data within Azure, Azure data services, but also other clouds. So we have connectors for Google BigQuery and for um, AWS Redshift as well. And customers love the fact that they can take advantage of the investment they've already made within SSIS because they can um, lift and ship those packages up into Azure so they can make the most out of their kind of investment that they've already made. And then finally, they can take advantage of the fact that this is a service, right? It's a, it's a platform as a service, so all customers need to worry about is their data, and they can kind of leave the infrastructure to, to us. And they can take advantage of everything that Azure brings. So as their customers' data is growing, they, they take advantage of the scalability of the cloud, and they kind of don't have to worry about that infrastructure and, and scaling up. We've also recently announced a lot of new features that are coming to Azure Data Factory to make this a little bit more accessible for, for new users. So we've now introduced a, a feature called Mapping Data Flow, and this allows you to actually monitor and manage your pipelines visually. So it's a, a drag and drop interface, it's a no-code experience, and again, it's just kind of lowering that barrier to entry for users. Uh, this preview is available for everyone to sign up to, and I think hopefully you'll get a copy of the slides or you can give it a quick uh, Google or a Bing. And I just wanted to bring it to life by sharing one of my favorite customer case studies. So wreck it Benkiser, our consumer goods um, organization, you know, they own some of the brands that we all know and love, like Dettol and Clearasell, and they were really unsatisfied with their existing business intelligence solution. So what they did is um, they, they came to Microsoft and our team sat down with them and, and built a, an architecture like the one you saw previously so that they could ingest all of their internal data sources and also kind of third party data sources so that they can make all of this data kind of um, self-serve and accessible for their sales force. 
So they've given access to all 40,000 of their sellers so that they can see how all of their products are performing. So they can see each product, how it's performing in each retailer. So it enables them to start making some smarter decisions around product placement um, and, and also like regions that they want to focus on going forward. So before I hand back over, I just wanted to recap on why Power BI and Azure Data Services is, is the best place to run your analytical uh, platform. And I think the reason for this is because it's, it's unifying those data silos. It's giving you one place to store all of your data. We're seeing a lot of customers that are now taking an interest in this unified data lake, which they can then kind of create their insights and give access to specific teams on top of. We know that with Azure, you've kind of got the, the scalability and, and the power to not have to worry about running out of space. Um, and you can take advantage of all of our latest innovations. So with things like Azure Databricks, um, HD Insight, and machine learning services, you can actually get a deeper level of insights by uh, making this accessible to, to your teams. And again, it, it's the self-service element of it. So it's really easy for people to consume. You can um, overlay Power BI on top of the data lake, on top of those um, common data model folders, and you can uh, empower your teams to be able to make smarter decisions um, quick, more quickly. And I know it's just me stood on stage telling you this um, and what do I know, but for the fifth consecutive year in a row, um, Gartner have uh, made us leaders in both the analytics and BI category as well as the data management solution. So hopefully they know what they're talking about and I think it, sh it shows that uh, Azure is a great place to run your analytics solutions going forward. I'll be around at the stand for the rest of the afternoon, so any questions, just let me know. Thank you very much, Jody. Much appreciated. So that's in jest. And that's the starting point of our story today. If we move on, we've now got Transform. And we're going to hear from Sika on exactly how Splunk do it. Be careful. Oh, yeah. She's not hurt her knee recently. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Where were the broken knees? Have to pay attention. <laughs> so, hello, thank you. Um, welcome to the Transform bit. Um, I actually was just thing to someone earlier the stand, if you transform your data, you can transform the world, which I think is quite a nice statement to have. Um, so my name is Sika. I am an IT operations analytics specialist at Splunk, but I'm also a mathematician, which is actually my background. So I'm quite proud of the data analytics that we provide and the machine learning we have uh, provided in our, in our portfolio and our solutions. Um, so you heard today, actually, I got to show you this slide, I'm sorry. I'm sure everyone's seen this. So you've heard, all of you heard today, um, our chief advisory officer, James Hodge, speak about the dark data. And also, following this, he explained how can you Splunk for many, many different use cases, but because um, we're in this talk today, and I'm, it's one of my favorite topics anyway, and my background, we're going to focus on an IT incident from an ITIL perspective. Um, so it would be interesting to know that all of your customers experience this all the time. And Uptime Institute have recently come up with the, or calculated the cost, and it's actually, as you can see, this is what an IT incident costs. Imagine now your customers having a few of those per month. So what, what does it cost to the business? What do your customers actually do with it, and how does it, not, how does it still, how does it actually work currently? Well, most of them are still at the existing existing way of doing things. So when I first started working in IT about 20 years ago, well, it's pretty much 20 years ago, um, we were kind of in a, just starting to do monitoring, starting to analyze, starting to put thresholds, to send alerts, and starting to understand what do they do, what they, do they have in common, how do we find the root cause. Well, I think about it, most of the customers, or your customers, are still actually there. They still wait for their customers to inform them, or they still wait for an alert storm to come in to start actually investigating. If you want to be more effective, of course, you can introduce a certain amount of automation, so you can start, well, correlating, start basic automatic correlation, writing rules to the back, um, even start automating, automating the resolution, which brings us further down, but not too much. Now, if you, and this is something that Splunk does, if you introduce machine learning and start using machine learning on your incidents and, your, and the amount of your alerts and events, you can actually not only bring down the, um, not only bring down the um, mean time to acknowledge or to detect even, but also obviously meant to bring, bring down the mean time to repair. 
but what if you could actually prevent an, an incident by predicting it 30 minutes in advance? Well, this is clearly what's going to, well, this is clearly going to give you 30 minutes back to the business. This is time of everyone that will be normally working on this incident. This is customers being happy. It's about, all about customer experience, right? Because we IT people speak in SLAs, but business speaks in customer experience, so we gotta make them happy as well. So this is basically 30 minutes back to the business. So imagine if you could take all your data, and um, well, all of us actually spoke about this earlier as well, um, how data is really siloed currently. If you think about, uh, Jody was speaking about the Azure, but with, have, with, with a cloud strategy and even multi-cloud being an absolute trend in 2019, um, also, by the way, by Uptime Institute, um, you think about it, well, customers, so they have they, their data in different cloud providers in, in Azure, in AWS, in G Cloud, they have these archive, then they have certain um, old technology, some of it is on-prem, and how do you make sense of it? How do you actually deal with all of this data? Well, first of all, first and foremost, as I said, we have to somehow collect the data, right? It's pretty clear, if we don't have the data, we can't analyze it. Then, what Splunk does actually, obviously dynamic thresholding, I explained as well, um, it's quite, it's quite important because something that is happening on a Monday morning um, and it's actually all right is not necessarily okay if, if the same thing is happening on Tuesday afternoon. So that's quite important. But the most important and powerful thing about Splunk is what we call the schema on the fly, which is we take the data, but we're not putting a relational schema at the back. So the minute you ask a question, the schema is built at the back, which means, or the schema is built, which means that different people can ask different questions on the same data. So we basically have different lenses to look at the data. So when I do my um, event management, because this is one of my um, other topics actually, of interest of mine, uh, when I do my event management trainings, I always say to people, the most important thing is once you have your data and your incidents, your alerts, your events, you need to start correlating. So there's two things, and correlation is number one. So finding the things that actually belong together and if you apply machine learning on the amount of, of data that's coming in from the different silos, then you can find relations that the human ne wouldn't necessarily see, but also you can find the relations at scale. So what Splunk does, with, uh, we use machine learning algorithms to find relations between the different events, and in between the different um, alerts and, and um, incidents, and group them together in what we call episodes. By grouping them, we obviously not only reduce the noise, but also provide the immediate um, view to your customers of what's actually related to each other. The second, after correlation, the second bit that um, I say in my trainings is the most important one then is to slice this bit down the service route. So to slice all that's going on, in con put it into context, slice it down the, the service context route, right? So correlation and context are two most important things. The third thing that um, I think, well, that you can think of corresponding to the being proactive, being predictive at Splunk is start to introduce anomaly detection. And the anomaly detection, so the first, um, the first two, the correlation and the context bit are uh, is based on supervised machine learning, but the anomaly detection is based on unsupervised machine learning. And when I say anomaly detection, I mean we establish a base, uh, a, a normal baseline, and we can detect deviations from it. And it could be deviations from past behavior, it could be deviations from normality as defined by someone, or quite important, could be deviation from peers. So if you imagine a cluster of, let's say, virtual machines, or even containers, um, say we have five of those together, and four of them are 10%, but one of them is at 30%. Well, this is not necessarily an issue, and it's not causing you problems yet, but you want to have an early warning, so you want to be notified, you want to, see, to know that it's there, because there could be different reasons for it. Maybe your load balancer is down or something, so it, it definitely will give you information to make an informed decision out of that. I already explained before that when we have, when we group, we use machine learning to group the different events um, and alerts together into, into what we call episodes. We also have the possibility to see something that a human wouldn't necessarily see immediately. So we see relations that you wouldn't see before. And this points you immediately to the root cause, okay? Because you know that belongs together in events. You know that one of them 
would have happened, usually the ones that happen at the very beginning, so the timeline first, um, you understand that this probably is related to the root cause. And the last but not least is how do we get predictive? And I'm quite proud actually of this because it's something that we developed with one of our customers, TransUnion. And TransUnion was part of our ML advisory program and together with our um, ML advisory guys, they, we developed an algorithm that can predict outages 30 minutes in advance. But in fact, um, TransUnion now has gone further, obviously developed their, on their own data. Um, so they're currently at 48 hours in advance prediction. So as you can see, uh, we have up to 45% reduction in high priority incidents, so the P1 severity ones incident, and we achieve up to between 7 and 90% reduction in investigation time. Um, I would say that most of the customers that I have in Europe, um, so I'm going to be a wide role, they're actually about 87%, I think. And we achieve up to 83% reduction in business impact. Okay, so if you take a few things from what I want you to take from this, uh, from this session is that you can, with Splunk, you can ask any question at any time. You can find new unknowns, utilizing the machine learning that's built into the system. So you can observe and monitor what's going on, then analyze it and act upon it at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sika. Much appreciated, Ard. Yeah. So this is because, by the way, we had a bit of a catastrophic failure of the step in the first presentation, which left me literally on my ass on the stage, which was not particularly dignified for anybody. So we've gone through ingest. We've learned how, the bre how to widen our reach of data, should we say, and get the words out. It's been a long day. We've learned how to transform that data. And Sika touched on something really important. Transformation can really, it's not just turning the data into information, it's turning the data into immediately actionable information. So being able to predict 30 minutes in advance that something's going to fail, predictive analytics, and then being able to use that information to send an engineer out before something fails. That fundamentally changes the business rules. If you're an organization that sells insurance, or if you're an organization that sells fridges, industrial fridges, and you could turn around and go, I will sell you a service where I either send an engineer when something breaks, or I send an engineer before it breaks, and my insurance, this, this premium support you're going to buy, means that you never, ever have an outage. This is not witchcraft. This is not the future. This is today. And this is something I want everyone to think, start thinking about how actually that could fundamentally change their customers and, and change the way that they do business. So now we've built this really invaluable and really important information. It's now, to like turn, uh, it's now time to learn how we store it. So I'd like to introduce Grant from NetApp to come tell us what they do. Thank you, Grant. Thank you. Avoiding the step, the cursed step, I think. Um, so I'm Grant Cayley, uh, the chief technologist from NetApp in the UK and Ireland. And it's interesting hearing the conversations that we've had earlier on that David's mentioned about really how do you build you know, data intelligence. And really, the key thing about that is it's all predicated on data. You know? And the more data you can feed into these models that people are doing from an analysis perspective or from an AI perspective, the better the outcome you can get. So really, customers are thinking about how do they capture all of those data sources, as was mentioned by Microsoft and Jody. Uh, and Basilka in terms of what Splunk can do, but how can you capture all of those data sources, pull all of that data together, and then apply analytics, apply AI to this? And the real challenge for businesses today is that a lot of the technologies they're using to apply analytics and AI is not necessarily deployed in the data center anymore. It may de be deployed at the edge of their networks where they need real-time capability and answer to particular queries that impact what they're doing in their operational facilities, for example. Or it might be that they want to leverage the AI and the analytics services that are available in the likes of Azure and Google, AWS or Alibaba if you're in China. There's a whole range of locations that data needs to be dealt with, delivered to, protected, moved between, etc. And that's really fundamental to what I'm going to talk about today, which is how can you actually build an underpinning data fabric to enable all of this technological capability, this data intelligence that we've talked about uh, on top. 
So the person who actually wrangles the data, and I think that's a term for what's known in the Wild West as data management nowadays or something like that, is what the data scientist does. And their job really is a lot around about taking the business outcome that's desired and taking the data sources that are available and then really processing that data, cleaning it, data masking it, pruning it, formatting it, getting it into the systems in the format and, the, and getting it into the systems at the rate which they need. For example, with AI processing, being able to feed GPU processors at the speed at which you know, they can get the data through, they can make use of those resources, they can deliver real time if that's needed responses, and really then delivering an output to the business. So the data scientist spends his day optimizing, tuning, you know, working on his algorithms, trying to work out how to do things faster, more succinctly. And that's a real challenge for them to deliver. And these guys and girls are expensive resources to have working on your data sets. What they're not thinking about is actually what's actually powering the data which they're consuming and absorbing into all of these uses which they have. Effectively, the infrastructure that's provided underneath. And we're not just talking, as I mentioned, about the infrastructure that's in the data center. We're talking about infrastructure at the edge of the networks. We're talking about infrastructure that's based in the cloud or on the cloud is maybe a better way of describing that. And the interesting thing, and actually our CEO, George Kurian, went to uh, Google Next a few weeks ago, and he listened to one of the data science technical tracks. Uh, the data scientist was waxing lyrical about how he spends his time optimizing his algorithms, driving his GPUs at capacity to make sure that he can efficiently get the outcomes uh, that the business are looking for. And at the end of the talk, George went up to him and said, you know, that's interesting what you're, what you're doing, the optimization, the speed you're trying to deliver data through these processes and, and algorithms, etc. But what if you could do that twice as fast? What if you could deliver parallel sets of data and process that without incurring parallel sets of costs to host that data? What if you could make all of that faster and deliver those services not just on premise, but in the cloud or even in multiple clouds at the same time? Wouldn't that improve your, your capabilities and, and what you can deliver for your business? And the guy, well, that would be fantastic. How do I do that? And he said, well, the answer is actually in the infrastructure that your data sits on. And at that point, he asked for George's business card as to how he could actually do that and for a follow-up later. But I'm going to talk a bit about how that's actually uh, achievable. So when, and this is an AI example in particular, when uh, David talked about building a data pipeline to go through not just the ingestion of data, maybe from the edge of the network, whether it's the factory or the shop floor or IoT devices and sensors that are sitting out there, there's a real requirement to pre-process that data at the edge, often before it's even replicated back to the data center. And the reason is that A, there's cost efficiencies to be had, there's performance advantages to doing it nearer to the source, there's maybe actually feedback loops that have to be created between the data at the edge, processing it, providing a response, and then sending perhaps metadata back to the data center. And to do that, you really need to have some form of capable data management infrastructure, probably software defined, but not necessarily sitting at the edge of the network. And then when the data is actually sent back to the core, which, which is maybe where the customer or the business is building a data lake, they need to store huge amounts of data. I mean, we talked about how much data AI needs. And I think on Jody's slide, she'd mentioned zettabytes of data being produced. Well, actually, you know, even self-driving cars, they're feeding petabytes of data into those models to try and refine, to try and get the algorithms to be as succinct and as, uh, and as predictive, if you like, in terms of what they're actually outputting. And to do that, you need as much data as you can generate. But that has to be managed. It has to be coped, built in a data lake. And actually, if you can build a data lake that becomes a golden repository, it can become the source of not just AI data in terms of feeding that, but for analytics, for other applications to use without incurring costs by keeping multiple untracked sets of data around. So being able to build a data lake on premise in your data center is really important as well. But then when it comes to building the AI models and training the algorithms, you often need a variety of things. The first thing is you're probably deploying relatively expensive GPU hardware. You heard the uh, conversation from NVIDIA early on. These GPUs need to be fed data as fast as possible in order to maximize the productivity and maximize the time to resolution in terms of what you have. So in terms of building this data lake, you almost need to get into the scenario of building a data lake which has multiple tiers of performance, of latency and performance that it can deliver in terms of its ability to provide access to that data. And then once you've trained your algorithms and you're then looking to deploy the, the results in the field in production, you then need to start thinking about how you start to wrap more enterprise SLAs around about that data. And all of this needs to be delivered from the infrastructure that's sat underneath. But actually, 
at that point, maybe some customers are actually looking at maybe even starting in the cloud with their, with their AI and their analytics capability because the technology is there, it's available, it's easy to use. Or maybe they're looking at shifting some of their data into the cloud and taking advantage of the archive capabilities. Or actually for some customers, they're actually looking to take further advantage of analytics and AI that the cloud can offer to get even further insight on the data. So if you're looking at this building this data pipeline from a customer perspective, how do you deliver the infrastructure, the data management consistently across not just the edge of the network, the core in the data center, but also in the cloud as well? And it's a real challenge to consider how you actually do that and to do it with an operationally uh, simplistic and common, common way of approaching the data management itself. So this is really where NetApp's value comes into play for our customers and obviously for you, our partners, in terms of what you position for your customers. Because the customers are looking for solutions at the edge of the network where it's maybe not a hardware solution. It's maybe a software-defined x86 box that needs to run multiple services. How can I deploy data management there? Or maybe it's in the data center where they are looking for the, the, the biggest capacity, the highest performance, the lowest latency solutions in terms of what they can deliver. Or it's actually taking advantage of pushing their data into the cloud, into AWS, into Azure, into Google, into Alibaba, but delivering a consistency of data management across this. And NetApp's solution to this is to really firstly offer endpoints in each of these different environments that customers can put their data onto. Some are hardware defined, some are software defined. But those endpoints then become part of the data fabric. And once you have that, you can then build a commonality of data mobility between those environments, efficient replication, efficient uh, you know, kind of, uh, transfer of data, syncing of data, but also being able to build commonality of data protection, high availability, disaster recovery, business continuity. That's the same in all of these environments, not different because you're in one cloud versus an on-premises environment. And then layering on security, whether it's encryption with out of cloud key management, for example, and having that pervasive across this whole data fabric. But as you build these environments, what's important is that they're integrated into the applications that you wish to use on top of them. So these environments that we deploy as endpoints have to be API integratable into any framework, into any tool, into any platform that customers want to build or leverage, whether it's the cloud platforms that are offered by the hyperscalers or their own platforms that they build on premise or that actually sit uh, across all of these environments. So that's really important that what is, we provide integrates into those as well. And then of course, as you put your data outside of the data center, you really need to start keeping track of it where it is, the performance profiles, the risk profiles, the cost profiles. And that's really important when you leverage the cloud is tracking the cost versus maybe the on-premise cost versus the cost of different clouds and how you build services. So having the tools that provide not just that information, but also provide analytics to give you advanced warning of troubleshooting and capabilities that you might need to start thinking of. And then finally, if we're going to build this, this data fabric landscape, why not leverage on data services on top of that data? So things like anomaly detection, or maybe building that data and connecting it to orchestration for containerization that could deliver those services with portability across multiple clouds, including on-premise. And this is really where NetApp are focused today on building this data fabric for our customers. And as partners, this really gives you the ultimate choice as to whether you're selling a solution for a customer who just wishes to build something on-premise, or who's building in a private cloud or the edge of their network, or that's looking to build in the public clouds. We've got data management capabilities that cover all of these environments. And to give you a very short example of a customer that does this, you know, this manufacturing customer is actually capturing data at the edge of their network from sensors and from dial home type of devices. They're aggregating that information at the edge, pre-processing it, but then they're replicating it. And actually that edge network is built on top of software defined storage. They're not using hardware platforms. They're using software defined technology to maximize the cost advantage they can get. But that data is then efficiently replicated into the data center where they then process it through Kafka to, you know, to kind of format and pre-process their IoT data where they then deliver it into an analytics platform based on Spark. But this data is actually then, when it's in the data center, is sitting in a common data lake that they can use to feed all of these technologies that want access to that single set of data. And they can also pre-process that data. They can apply different performance profiles. They can apply different tiering methodologies. And they can then bring their GPU farms and put it onto the same data set, but accelerate the data at that point to give them sub-microsecond latency access to really be able to drive those AI platforms. That's all built on common NetApp technology at the edge and in the data center. 
But for this particular customer, the analytics that they could build themselves and the AI they could build themselves wasn't enough that they could actually generate the outcomes. They needed to leverage the AI services and the analytics services from the cloud providers. So they were using Databricks from AWS. At the same time, and on the same data set, they were using HD Insight from Azure. And they're now looking at what AI services they can bring to that data. But the interesting thing here is they didn't create three copies and push it into three clouds. They brought those three clouds to the one data set. So they drove real efficiency in terms of how they were able to produce solutions, but importantly, maintain commonality of operational data management in terms of all the things I talked about, like data protection, security, availability, et cetera, across that whole piece. And that's really where NetApp's value comes to play, is giving customers the choice and the flexibility to deploy across a hybrid cloud and to build these types of applications. So I'll pass back to David, but I'm around for questions afterwards uh, if you want to come and have a chat. So thank you. Awesome. And please don't chat. Grant's a, a very friendly chap. So as Grant said, um, one of the most important things to think about when you are considering the store part of our data strategy is choice. And um, NetApp are still the only organization that are deeply embedded as you are into the hyperscalers. So one of the nice things about the NetApp solution is not just like a lot of organizations, you can spin something up on a VM. No, no, NetApp have actually gone and deeply embedded their technology fundamentally into the hyperscalers. So they really do give you choice, native choice, and the ability, as Grant said, to have consistency and one fundamental plane of management across all your data, wherever it may be. So we've covered ingest, we've covered transformation, we've covered store, but now we've got this valuable information, we've got it stored, we've got it where we need it, how do we protect it? And for that, I'd like to enjoy, in, I'd like James to come on from Convo and uh, yeah, give us a bit of a bit of insight into that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was just at the end of the uh, the last presentation we did on this that I, I realized the deep irony of uh, me actually doing this presentation. So I'm James Kirkland. I work for Convo. I'm actually the understudy of the uh, the person that was meant to be doing this. One of my colleagues, Nigel Tozer. So um, if you enjoyed the presentation today, I'm James Kirkland. If not, my name is Nigel. Um, so yeah, so they, they, don't, they don't normally let me out to speak to people, so I, it's, it's quite nice. Um, so I'm really going to talk about data protection um, from uh, the angle of actually uh, putting a solution in place uh, for, for a Convault customer which we um, interestingly did in conjunction with, uh, with, with NetApp. I'll talk to that in a bit more, in a bit more detail. Um, I think that in itself should hopefully give you a good understanding of what are some of the uh, things that, I guess, your customers, um, uh, organizations that you're currently speaking to or organizations that you would like to speak to are uh, having to address. And, and um, yeah, if it resonates, um, with, with, with that, then come and have a, a, a more detailed conversation with us. Um, there's a bullet point list in terms of um, some of the things that we see as the, the data challenges today. Um, it, I'm very much aware that the, um, the value of data directly relates to the uh, prioritization which you give it. And I know, for example, when I come back from a trip that I store my, uh, my passport in a more highly retrievable place than I necessarily do the Starbucks receipt that I used at, at, at the airport. And, and similarly, when I, um, as some of you do, get that conversation initially, if your children are at primary school, dad, what do you do? I have to write it in a school report. Um, giving my son a very, very boring explanation of data protection and backup until I got to the point where I confirmed to him that um, when he goes on his Xbox and plays Assassin's Creed and he gets to a new level, um, when he then goes back on X Xbox Live to use it again, software that I work with means that he can recall that, that, that kind of game. Suddenly that was something of interest that he could actually put into the, uh, into the report itself. And, and we see very much data as like that, and the project that I'm going to talk to you about very much comes at it from, from that perspective, is that you know, data isn't created equal. Um, yes, you've done a lot of work in terms of pulling all of this data together, but you are in a position where you, you have to kind of make some kind of priorities 
because you know there are systems that will go down and you can function there are systems that will go down and and the business will um the business will, will will fall over or as in the case of the final bullet point we've got there um you may need to recover a piece of information that is absolutely critical and your inability to be able to do that is going to have um significant business impact so the organization that i'm going to talk to you about is uh, astrazeneca um a Convolt customer, uh, uh, a NetApp customer as well. Um, uh, um, second largest uh, biopharmacal organization or company in the UK. Um, AstraZeneca, three priorities for them are the discovery of drugs, strangely enough. Um, discovery is a key part for them. Operating and manufacturing at a, uh, in, in an effective uh, cost, in, in a way that manages cost effectively. And finally, just creating a culture and an organization that shares information that um, effectively enables them to work in a good and collaborative way. And, and each of those areas, I'm sure you agree, each of those areas is fundamentally underpinned by data and the access to that data. So, um, so we, were, we were actually brought into this, uh, in the, into this particular engagement via, um, via our good friends, uh, good friends NetApp. And... Um, NetApp had been working very closely with AstraZeneca to put the uh, the data fabric kind of solution in place, and there were requirements around um, uh, service availability and service resilience, particularly brought on by uh, the requirements for, uh, well, concern about ransomware attacks. Um, they had a very mature approach to ransomware, which was when we get hit rather than if we get hit. Uh, an organization that has their level of, of, of profile, I think that's that's fair enough thing to do. And they, and they were concerned, obviously concerned about that. Not so much in terms of the data that they had, but they operated sort of uh, uh, 10 to 15 critical systems, which were, if were not available, they couldn't actually function as a, as a business. And being applications, they needed to have application aware recovery relating to that. They needed to get the critical applications as near as they could back to a state whereby they could continue with their business. And, um, and that's why we were, we, were, we were brought in to further enhance the capability uh, that, that NetApp offered in terms of um, snapping capability and to, to kind of spread that out further. As a, as, a, as, a, as a benefit to that, and what was key, I think, in terms of looking at their own return in, in terms of doing this, because yes, obviously there is a cost in terms of protecting data, but anything that you can do or that you can offer to your customers that will in some way minimize the cost associated with that can provide the business justification that they need to, to maybe kind of do the project. And th there's not an organization I know of that wouldn't appreciate uh, improved in service levels and a reduction in cost. I think that's kind of the nirvana in terms of um, operations. So uh, historically, uh, AZ had been through a series of outsource, insource, insource, outsource conversations, and they ended up with a, oh sorry, contracts, and they ended up with a plethora of tools in this particular space. And one of the things we kind of say is you cannot manage complexity with complexity. So if you have a, if you have a complex IT estate, a plethora of tools will just lead to increased complexity. What you need to do is consolidate that down. And that, that was one of the driving forces in terms of working with, with, with Convolt on, and NetApp on that, in that they could bring that together, that simplification. Um, and, and that kind of single point of, single point of control, that from a single point, they could get an understanding of um, what, you know, what, what was available, what their service levels were, what was protected, um, when it was last protected, and, um, and just that general, I don't know, I can sleep at night, uh, assurance that the data is being, being effectively protected. Now, um, you can go Google or Bing, other search engines are available. Um, you can Google or Bing, uh, uh, Scott Hunter, you can see a picture of him there. Scott Hunter, AstraZeneca, Convolt, and he gives you a much more detailed explanation of this. Um, we're available uh, at our stand if, if you want to come and talk to us. If you don't, I've been Nigel Taser. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So I think it's really important that it's um, often not very well thought through that 
this is now becoming a really critical application. Data-driven decision making is critical. And just because what we had previously was Excel, doesn't mean that when we now move into this new data-driven world, we don't need to think about actually if we're relying on this every day to make business decisions, we need to think about how to make it really highly available. It's also not a good enough excuse to think, well, it's, there's a lot of data that I'm running and I'm, I'm turning it into a lot of information. It still needs to be available. It still needs to be managed and protected, just like any critical infrastructure. So we have had ingest. We've had transform. We've had store. We've had protect. Last but by no means least, we have explore. I'd like to introduce. Ian Wood from Veritas is going to come and tell us about what Veritas are doing to help you explore your data. Good, thank you very much. Not a problem. If I can get the clicker from you, thank you. Um, so the good news is this is my second presentation, so I've mastered the ability to move slides and hold a mic in this hand at the same time. So this should go a lot smoother than before. So let me carry on. Oh, it's already moved uh, back. Whoa, sorry about that. I haven't mastered anything, I guess, <laughs> uh, clearly. so. The presentation title I have is from trash to treasure because I believe it's a good sentiment of a lot of the customers that I work with on a daily basis is that in order to explore data, in order to get value out of the data, they actually need to know what they have, where it's stored, where the difference is from uh, the cat video through to the uh, really critical business information that they store. And my experience shows that a lot of the customers, that's one of the fundamental things they struggle the most with. In fact, a lot of what they have is very much a dark room. And um, they live in darkness. And what, what you can't see, you can't manage. I think it's a pretty fundamental um, situation that you may have, is if you don't know where your data is to go and explore, then there's not much exploring to be had. You'll be exploring in the dark, walking around a dark room, uh, walking into cupboards and chairs and hurting yourself. So in essence, that darkness is where a lot of customers are challenged the most with. And for the last few years, we do a data survey uh, to organizations around the world. And by large, they come out with a pretty much the similar results. In fact, when we conducted the survey, uh, we wanted to know how organizations are managing exploring data generically. And we discovered this concept we call the Databerg. And the Databerg, pretty much as the, the name explains, is the concept that most of the organization's data is dark. It lies beneath the water. They can't see it. And um, in essence, 54% of organizations' data is dark. And that's one of the biggest challenges that they have to face is turning the lights on so they can explore and get value out of that data. Unfortunately, when they turn the lights on, they often see something like that. And that could be a, a, a big rubbish dump out there. And I guarantee you that there's someone's wedding ring in there. There's probably someone's wedding photos. There's potentially some of their photos of their ex-wife that they did want to throw away in that same pile of data. But it's difficult to work out what is valuable and what is trash. And ultimately, that's one of the key things we want to talk about here in Veritas. So you're probably thinking, if you know Veritas, why, as the, the world's leader in data protection and data protection software, talking about data exploration. And the reason I want to sort of uh, highlight that is I believe that the protection data, your otherwise known as secondary data, is potentially one of the biggest valuable assets that your customers may have out there that they can exploit. Um, I feel that gone are the days that we protect data, backup data, that it could be resuscitated in the event of a failure. Why not use some of that data to more value proactively? And that's some of what I'm going to show we're doing in Veritas and talk to some examples around uh, visibility and managing data a lot more effectively born out of data protection. So I've had many a presentation in many a situation in my career, and most of Veritas presentations talked about data growth. In fact, it reminded me of a presentation I liked the most, which was a bunch of iPads stacked from here to the moon. Had anybody seen that kind of presentation that we built? And in essence, it says that the amount of data that we have today in the digital universe will fill up 64 uh, gigabyte iPads stacked to the moon and back seven times. So we have a lot of data. 
why do we have a lot of data is in essence we're all data hoarders. How many people is it, are a data hoarder? It's, it's okay to say you're a data hoarder. It's not a bad disease. There's no magic pill, unfortunately, but there's certainly one of the key challenges. People store data forever. I'm also a technologist and I've been in the storage industry for 20 years. And a lot of what technologists look at and storage people look at is the left-hand side of that equation. And that equation is one petabyte. And one petabyte is the amount of storage. That's typically, if you speak to a storage person, infrastructure people, they'll talk about petabytes. And petabytes and zettabytes and loads and loads of data. What I think is more interesting and what are the change in my narrative today is on the right-hand side, at the bottom of that equation, is the amount of files or objects that um, one petabyte represents, and that's three billion. So for every petabyte, and by the way, a petabyte's not a lot of data anymore. For every petabyte of data your customers have, they have to manage three billion objects or three billion files if it's unstructured data. And by the way, unstructured data is what most of us are looking at right now as a, the biggest challenge, because structured data is by its design structured, it's much more effectively managed. And it's that that causes the biggest challenge and those challenges come around either cost, because one petabyte uh, of data could cost you some money, but let's be honest, storage is come, becoming cheaper. Every year, storage doubles its capacity, pretty much for the same price. Storage is getting cheaper, but it's the management of those three billion instances, files, or objects, that's the headache. And that's one of the areas of cost, is in managing those three billion amount of unstructured data. One is that's most topical, especially in Europe, is risk. Um, there are a lot more data privacy regulations that are coming into effect here in Europe and in the UK around data privacy, things like GDPR. And the fines are pretty big, right? Because there's big consequences if you get it wrong. And GDPR or data privacy laws are all about protecting my data. Well, not my data itself, but our data, our personal data. But if you have three billion files, where is your PII? Where's your personal information? How do you protect that? How do you reduce the risk? And then finally, what we're talking about here is the upside of data, the oil of the 21st century. How do we find valuable data out of those three billion files? So we have to manage that data a lot more effectively. And so there's three things. I am a very simple person. I can only think in threes. Apologies for that. And I thought in these three things, find, filter, and act. And the, the fine filter and act came from the concept that I spend a lot of my life in Excel. And normally in Excel, what am I doing? I'm finding data, I'm filtering data, and I'm acting upon it. So I wanted to use the same analogy, but on a bigger scale of exploring data for data intelligence. So if I look at finding data, it's important that organizations have tools and technologies and process that allows them to get a better handle on their data. This is one example, by the way, it's not meant to be a test for you to see the data in our dashboard of a technology we called InfoStudio. And InfoStudio is this concept that we can utilize not only our protection data, so our protection products, but many other data sources from on-premise, virtual, and cloud, and give you data about data, information about information in essence, as the concept that we can go out there and tag all the metadata that you have in those three billion files, and start to paint a picture of what they look like. And again, pretty much like our data Berg survey revealed, most of the data is old, stick, and stale, or duplicated, repeated in multiple systems, on-premises, and in the cloud. And again, going into find, filter, and act, once I find that information, there could be some quick acting here. I could find all my orphan data, data that's older than five or six years, and I can archive that data for the future put it into really cold storage in the cloud, for example, because I could utilize that in the future where it's really, really cheap, or put that into some other archive system uh, on-premises if you choose, so that in the future I may get some value out of it. You could choose to delete it. In some of the surveys and assessments we've done here, I didn't reveal this to partners out there. We've got an internal presentation where we've shown some dark data assessments Veritas have done. We've seen some horrific things. We've seen a lot of videos, films, movies. We've seen some movies with job titles I would not reveal. In customers' network and their data, lots of illegal information that sits there. Uh, credit card files, personal data that's shared uh, in, in um, OneDrive box folders that shouldn't be unsecurely. So once you can find your data, you can manage that risk. 
So filtering is another way of classification. And the view there is that in order to sustain and manage the amount of data that we have, we have to learn to classify that data automatically. The data needs to be classified so that you can find the needle in the haystack. You don't want to treat all information the same. You may want to send your confidential classified information to one area that's super secure. You may want to send your business critical information to an area. You may, as I said earlier, want to archive or, 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 um, or delete your stale and orphan data out there. And you may want to find PII for GDPR subject access requests. So in order to do this uh, idea of what is classification, I thought I'd do a really simple exercise that failed the last time around. But I know this team are a lot more advanced. We're going we're gonna to really pass. But So in order to classify, just really simply, how do we classify? So if everybody that's born in the UK, please stand up. Let's get some activity. So most of you are all born in the UK. So what I've classified is the people standing or in the, born in the UK, the people sitting clearly haven't, or they haven't heard the question, or they're lying. I'm not too sure which one of those. Now, those that have sold Veritas in their past, raise your hand. So what we've classified is people that are born in the UK that have sold Veritas versus the rest. Does that make sense? A very simple exercise on what class classification means. So if you can also do me another favor, if you can look underneath your chairs, because there's a prize, whoever finds something is going to come and do the rest of my presentation. No, I'm joking. Um, it's not that. If you can sit down, everybody under, look, under, look underneath your chairs, and you may find a surprise, and we'll classify you guys as winners. There we go. So some people have won an Echo Dot, courtesy of Veritas. Well done. If you are super smart and advanced, you would have noticed that I would not have known where the Echo Dots would have been put. So you go check other chairs to win a prize. <laughs> so you can go around and looking at the other chairs before or after, but congratulations, we have classified you as winners of Veritas, and you get to use an Echo Dot. So, um, and if you're really interested, we've got some uh, Alexa integration with some of our technologies on YouTube. You can have a look at that where we are asking some questions around uh, integration with our net backup, backup technology. And the final area is around acting, and it's pretty much like the word says, once I've classified, I can act. We don't have to store everything the same. If I can automatically classify data as it's ingested or stored, I'm in the best possible position. We can store that information accordingly. I may want to store personal identifiable information in a certain area so that I can retrieve it very, very quickly if I get a, an access request for GDPR. I may want to store confidential data, and my company's policy may say never send that data out of my data centers into the cloud until we've gone and secured it and have a better understanding on our cloud strategy. And then you may want to go and simply delete data. So that's a summary of how I believe we can get better at exploring data for data intelligence is around simple things, find, filter, and act. And in the beginning, I talked a little bit about Veritas Info Studio. In the classification area, Veritas, we've embedded our unified classification engine that exists in all of our technologies. So you can classify data uniformly against all of the Veritas technologies to start making better value decisions on where to store the information, whether to protect the information, or whether to go and archive the information into our technologies. And then ACT would be the physical act. Once I know where the data is, I can act upon it. Summary Veritas slide. So again, we're known for the protection side as Veritas with some of our data protection flagship products like NetBackup and Backup Exec. We also have two other areas to Veritas, one around availability. And our view there is born out of protection comes the better availability. So we have disaster recovery, highly available technologies that have been protecting some of the world's largest environments now for the last two decades and still protect those on-premises and now in the cloud and the multi-cloud. And then finally, the section I've covered on the right-hand side is the insight section, pro providing more value into the data that you have before. So thank you very much for your time. Awesome. So thank you very much. Um, so it's interesting. Both Jody and Ian mentioned a term that I hear banded around all the time, which is data is the new oil. Now, it is, absolutely. But can I put oil in my car as a fuel? No, I have to refine it. And I hope that from today, you've got an idea of what the data refinery looks like and the process and the various steps that are really important in going from one side of that equation, 
one side of that chart we had at the start to the other. And building out what we call the enterprise data strategy inside your customers' organizations. Now, I have a call to action as well. And my call to action is really simple. Ask your customers, have they thought about their enterprise data strategy? Because I guarantee 90% of them will, uh, will be the answer, no. 90% of our customers have no idea what their enterprise data strategy is. They have an enterprise cloud strategy. They have an enterprise networking strategy. Most of them have an enterprise telephony strategy. But none of them will deliver the business value that having a solid, repeatable, scalable enterprise data strategy will have in the organization. And then once you've had them say, no, can you help me? Come and talk to us. And come and talk to the vendors that we've had, our fabulous sponsors, for today's talk.